Thanks. Um, okay, so my name is Ashwin. Welcome to the session. So um, I'm I'm from Autodesk, uh, part of uh, Forge. Okay, can you hear me now? Better. Okay, <laughs> so so I'm part of the Forge API management platform in Autodesk. So um, my responsibility here is to provide a platform that is highly available, scalable, and resilient. So let's see what we have in the session. So we are going to cover um, these things for the session. So let's go through one uh, use case of Autodesk uh, where um, I'll talk about how our customers use the software and what is uh, you know the problems that we face and how we are solving it. Then talk about the problem statement and the solution, as I said. Then what are the business drivers to um, maintain or manage the traffic? Uh, so mostly how we control the traffic and um, why are we doing that? If we get time, I'll give a quick demo and uh, what we are doing with Resiliency SDK. So um, yeah, let's get right into it. So can I know how many of you know rate limits, about rate limits or using the rate limits in their production as of today? OK. And how many of you ever heard about API rate limits? Anybody? OK. So very few. OK, that's cool. <laughs> so OK, that'll be interesting. Um, OK, a quick note about uh, what we are, who we are. So basically, for those who don't know Autodesk, we help our customers to design and make things from skyscrapers to smart cars, from buildings to uh, blockbuster movies. So we have a varied range of products uh, which help in automating from designing in the digital world to making them in the real world. So this is what Autodesk is about. And this is our ecosystem of Forge where this is, Forge is an API platform for Autodesk. So we have started building cloud platforms probably around four to five years. And um, so we have some uh, cool softwares out there, like uh, you can convert a 3D, uh, so a picture into a 3D model. And there's a lot more softwares which help you, uh, you know, build your own things. So you can make anything pretty much out of these uh, uh, soft uh, APIs basically. So we compare it with Legos where you build your own things, you design what you want. So, so this is a common platform, common data environment where we are trying to connect people, uh, processes and the information around um, uh, this data environment. So let's look at a customer use case. So typically, um, I'll take an example of uh, Revit. Revit is our uh, building information modeling. So this is used for construction uh, designing. So basically, if you have ever looked at uh, you know, any engineer doing his drawings in the 3D and all that. So, so Revit is one of the designing tools which help you design those uh, construction uh, uh, designs. So let's say this is the Revit model. And uh, so when you look at that, it's not a static image. It has a lot of details in it. You can like you know deep dive in and see th the exact structure of that and what material is being used. There's so many properties and relationships between each part that gets associated. So a lot of information goes into that. And similarly, there are other platforms or tools uh, th that has a similar design concepts. So the thing I'm trying to say here is like these are heavy models that we are dealing with. And when we deal with a collaboration platform like uh, BIM Design. So BIM Design is a collaboration platform for construction industry where uh, you can create projects, you can uh, you know, create teams, collaborate across the field, uh, the people on the field and you know, the back-end teams, the operations teams, everybody collaborate on these platforms. So now, now when you're doing that, you're actually not just looking at the model, you're actually cor uh, correlating or you, can, you have to extract the project details from every model and you are able to correlate them with different models. So there's a lot of things that happens on uh, these platforms. So, so what exactly happens internally? So this is our architecture. So um, on the high level, so for north-south kind of traffic, so we have Apigee API management platform. So um, this is the entry point into our Forge APIs. Then we have our product APIs like BIM and Viewer and uh, many more products who are actually dependent on foundational services. So when I say foundational services, we have identity, access management, data management, where, where you do the relationship properties and collaboration that I talked about. So these are pretty heavy uh, compute intense uh, operations that are going on. And so, you know, 
So it's pretty important that we are highly available and uh, resilient, right? So <coughs> let's, so, so basically when, okay, let me go back to that slide. So when you're trying to um, access our products, let, and these products are internally relying on foundational services. Now, each foundational service, again, is dependent on other foundational services. So there are chan high chances that like one of them is being overburdened with all this traffic. And you know, uh, if anything goes wrong, somebody wrote a script which is you know, running infinitely. So this can really bring down the whole system. This is really bad for our, uh, you know, our brand. Basically, customers will lose trust. So it's pretty important that we have these highly scalable systems. So how do you handle such problems? So I'll take an example on the similar lines and uh, uh, portray the same thing that I said. So this is an ideal scenario where, we, in theory, we design systems assuming that there'll be a um, um, uh, not so traffic ingress gateway which, uh, where the traffic comes in and then you have your internal microservices which are intercommunicating and everything goes well. But in reality, what happens is there's one of the actors who doesn't really behave well. So these are the bad actors who cause disruption and you know there's an outage because of these guys. So what is happening? Eventually, this, some of the services going down and you know, they're rejecting calls from some of the consumers. Okay, so that's really bad. So now how do you handle that? So in such scenarios, there's no traffic controls in place and what is happening? So this is what happens when there's no traffic control in place, this chaos. So how do we solve this problem? So turns out there, is, there are multiple ways to handle these kind of problems and you control the traffic and do that. So one of the best ways to do it is using a throttling pattern. Okay, so you, you can do throttling in many ways. Uh, so the most common ways of doing throttling is rate limiting and load shedding. So load shedding is mostly based on the system state. Uh, you'll react uh, and you know the, you control the traffic. Uh, rate limits are more about pre-configured settings that you you know based on the capacity of your system. You'll configure them and you make sure the system is running smooth. You know, uh, so so how do we redesign the system um, so that the problematic system that we saw. So ideally, similar to what we have, um, we'll have an ingress gateway which is for all the external traffic and then internally, ideally, so, see, the, you need to have a common platform where the traffic is managed. Either you go with an internal gateway or you can have a mesh, service mesh kind of platform where you have a sidecar proxy which is basically a gateway for all your traffic where you can apply these common uh, patterns, right? So. What we do is uh, we have our own internal gateway where all the traffic uh, pass through, passes through and then uh, there we apply uh, different types of uh, rate limit configurations. I'll come to that in the later slides, um, probably the next slide. So what we do is um, we have different levels of controlling the traffic. So the first level is uh, basically a global spike arrest. So that is the cap on your system. So uh, when your backend system is able to serve only 10,000 requests per second, let's say for example. So you put that cap on this uh, global spike arrest and then any request beyond that is all rejected. There are different algorithms will come to that, but it, it acts based on what you have configured, but that is a cap, okay? So now what is it doing? It's helping uh, your customers or your traffic to be degraded gracefully. Okay, so you, you don't throw 500s and you go down for a couple of hours and then you go back and fix it. So that's not the right way to do it. You can degrade the experience of the customer and then you can you know, recover pretty well, pretty soon if you have pre-designed the system that way. So <coughs> yeah, so that's our first level. Now, next level is what we do is uh, for every service proxy, uh, we apply rate limits. So uh, that rate limits has a hierarchy. So you can apply rate limit per user ID. So we have a system called Oxygen, which is our identity and identity system. So we apply rate limits per user, per API key, and per um, uh, you know endpoint as well. So even in the endpoint, you have these levels of hierarchy where you can apply user level or API key level. If nothing applies, then there's a global defaults. So it cannot go beyond that. Okay, so if everything fails, then there are, there's a global spike arrest which is taking care of your system. 
Okay, so, so this is the level of hierarchy. This is mostly the common configuration that gets applied to every proxy that we deploy on Apigee. But uh, there are custom rules f based on every system's need. Uh, but uh, I think this is good enough for a general use case. So, and this is a rough uh, sample configuration that we use internally. So it's optional that you define a user based or API key based or um, uh, configuration. If you don't def uh, define anything, there's a uh, core system which takes care of applying the uh, spike arrest and uh, yeah, global rate limits basically. So we've talked about rate limits. We've talk so let's see what kind of rate limit algorithms that gets applied internally. So, so these are the high level. So there, there are a lot of algorithm that get that gets uh, used or like there are available in the market. But I'm going to talk about only three, which is token bucket, fixed window, and rolling window. It's a rolling window log. So for those who know Amazon-based API gateway, it uses a token bucket-based uh, um, algorithm. So we'll come to that one. So how does it work? Basically, it's a it's a bucket of tokens by the name. It's a bucket of tokens where you have a cap on the capacity. So you're predefining what, are, what is your cap, which is, let's say, B tokens are available in your bucket. Now, whenever a request is made for, by a user, what you do is you pick up a token from the bucket, and then you assign it to that request. So that there's one request removed. And every time there's a request, you'll keep removing that token from the bucket, and then you make the call. So there is a rate limit configuration that you would have to set which is, let's say in this case, x, x requests per second. You're allowing five requests per second. So after every second, the bucket is filled with five more, requests, five more tokens. So now there's a refilling happening continuously, and every user, um, so it's unique. Every user gets their own token, and then there's like a, uh, you know, the bucket is emptied by all the concurrent requests that are happening. But the flow is all, uh, you know, smoothened out, and then it's one token per request that's happening. Now, there is a downside to it. Basically, since in a distributed system, what happens is it's you get then update kind of scenario. So there might be problems like um, race conditions. But again, if you're using something like an Amazon API gateway, you need not worry about it. So they'll take care of it. So, so that's, that's how the token bucket works. The next one is the fixed window. So as the name suggests, Fixed window is uh, the most simplest and memory efficient. So if you are really not worried about, you know, like uh, an extra percentage of requests going through, uh, although you set uh, rate limits, then this is the best algorithm for you. So the thing is, within one minute, let's say I've, I've set uh, uh, something like 300 requests per, per minute. So it's going to allow 300 requests per minute, no matter what. Like, it's not a smoothened traffic. Basically, it can allow all the 300 at the beginning of the minute or towards the end. Now the problem here is if you're because of this pattern, if this is allowing all the traffic towards the end of the minute, now the second minute starts immediately, and you know if if you look at a rolling window, there can be a lot more than what you have said. So in this case, for example, it could be 540 requests in that uh, rolling window. That if you look at, it's only based on fixed time. So it's not very efficient, as I said, but uh, it's m memory efficient, but not very accurate in terms of applying the rate limits. So to solve this problem, there's another algorithm, which is a rolling window log. So exactly what I explained, the problem. So what it does is, at every second, when, whenever there's logs, uh, sorry, there, there's requests coming in, it recalculates what is the capacity of, uh, you know, the rate limit capacity that you are allowing uh, the request to come through. So, so I've, I haven't put that, but uh, what happens is at every request, it makes an entry into this log with the timestamp. So when you do a calculation five, five seconds down the line, what happens is like, let's say you started at 105 at five seconds, then 105, 10 seconds is basically uh, one minute past that 10 seconds. So it will be 104, 10 seconds. Uh, and 105, between 104, 10 seconds, and 105, 10 seconds. So for that period, uh, it is checking that uh, has your capacity reached, like 90 requests per minute, has it reached? If not, what is a available capacity? And then it will allow you. So that's how the rolling window works. But the problem or uh, the downside is that it is the, uh, it needs a fast random access memory. So something like a Redis, where you can use an atomic counter. Uh, so basically, 
the idea is that you cannot use a traditional storages and all. So it, uh, so there is a high compute involved in this. So, so if you need very accurate rate limiting, then this is how you do it. Okay. So we've talked about what are rate limits, uh, what are the scenarios, like why do we actually need them? Like what are the drivers technically and uh, you know, the business drivers for applying the rate limits? So I'll talk about three of such drivers, um, mainly uh, sudden spikes. Basically, this in our example, in our real use case, what I've explained. So if somebody wrote a bad script, it can actually uh, go into infinite loop and bring down the whole system. So, so it can happen in, you know, at some 100,000 requests per second can also happen if for such, with such a bad request, uh, sorry, with such a bad actors, right? So you never know what kind of traffic patterns are happening. So this is the scenario where you deal with uh, these certain traffic spikes. Other examples of uh, sudden traffic spikes could be like uh, brute force login attempts, or um, it could be some bad actor trying to, you know, um, um, make your service unavailable, like basically denial of service attacks and starving other consumers. So, 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 the way we handle such um, issues is using something like something called as a quota policy. So, okay, a quota policy is a terminology used in APG API management, but quota is basically by its name suggests that you are allocating a certain quota to every consumer, be it a user or an API key or any consumer. So, so with that, you are limiting the flow for every consumer. So, there can be distributed attacks. Again, that has to be handled in a different way. But uh, these are basic set of things that you are applying. And this is the most common use case where you will use that. Second one is a limited capacity. So you know that your system has a limited capacity. You have a cap on how many uh, resources you can use, right? So, so in that case, uh, obviously, we need rate limits with um, uh, there's something called as concurrent rate limiting where you will, m you will mention at any point of time what is the concurrent level of access that you're giving to your system. So, so this is how you can safeguard your system from um, more than the capacity of your system. So, and you're still giving a degraded experience to your customer. So when I say degraded, we'll come to that. So th there's multiple ways you can actually let your customers know. So, you, so if you've ever used a Amazon SDK, so all their services are rate limited. Basically, there, are, there is soft limit for everything on Amazon. So you need, if you need to access more, you need to contact them and get the limit increase. So, so what happens is uh, these SDKs, they have a built-in uh, resiliency. So whenever there is a uh, status code 429, too many requests, so then they retry. So there's different algorithms for retrying. So I'll come to what we do at Autodesk as well. But this is a, one example of how you handle a degrade, you know, like um, bad actors and provide a degraded experience to customers. So at least the system is safeguarded and, you know, you can resume back immediately once the, this traffic is uh, smoothened out. So that, that's how it works. And there are other examples uh, which I wouldn't recommend is uh, you throw a 503 and then you let them handle the... Uh, server side, uh, at least the system is safeguarded, but you, the customer doesn't know what to do. So that might not be fully graceful way of handling it, but that's another way you can, you can decide based on your scenario. So the final one is the monetizing. If, if you are monetizing your APIs, definitely you don't want your paid customers to suffer because of trial customers misbehaving, right? So, so, so this is an important use case where if you are into the business of APIs, then definitely you have to apply rate limits on uh, trial users, uh, limited rate limits for trial users compared to the pro, um, paid users. So, yeah, I guess I was able to cover uh, most of it. So let's let's see a, a demo. Basically, what I've done is I've um, used API Gateway and wrote a simple uh, number picking algorithm, uh, a logic in Lambda, and I've applied spike arrest and quota policy on API Gateway. So let me switch over. the wrong one. Okay, so this is uh, APG API management. So what I've done is I've applied a spike arrest of 20 requests per second, and this is an API key verification. So I need an API key to access this API. And I've applied a quota policy saying I will allow only three requests per API key. So uh, if it is more than three, then there's a quota policy error. And then finally, 
what I'm going to return to the customer is uh, uh, quota limit, what is the quota used, and when it is going to get reset. And when there is a throttling happening, we'll see what happens uh, after that. So this is a simple Postman script. Uh, so this is my endpoint on Apigee. I'm appending an API key to access this. So when I make this call, yeah, so what's happening is it's actually letting me in. It's giving me a random number. And it says uh, the quota that you have allocated for my API key is three, and I've used one. And then if I continue, it's going to reduce the quota from the, uh, that reduce the number from the quota. And then, uh, yeah, it throws 429. Now, what? Oh, I'm sorry. All right, let me do that again. OK. Let me do that again. So OK, so I need to wait 13 seconds uh, for this to reset. OK, four seconds more. Let me just wait. Let OK, so this is the first request that happened. As I said, there's a quota limit. What was said for my key is three, and I've used one. And then I'll continue for two more requests. Now it's going to throw me 429. So with 429, it's giving me when to retry after. So this is a very graceful way of degrading the experience of the customer. Now, he can write his consumer with handling what is a retry after. So he's going to, his uh, consumer um, SDK, the consumer SDK can retry exactly after this minute. But again, there is a problem uh, for your service when such things happen, right? Like if all your consumers are hitting at the same time and you're telling them to retry at the same time again, it's it's the same experience that you're gonna they're gonna they're gonna experience and then it's gonna degrade again. So so Amazon has a uh, has come up with this well-architected um, uh, algorithms, right? One of them is exponential back off with jitter. So you add that randomness in your retries, which will you know smoothen out the traffic uh, across and then then it gives you an even more graceful way of operating your service. So the, this was a demo. Let me just go back to my slide. So, so what we have done is something similar. We've started uh, generating resiliency SDKs. So basically what we do is, uh, apart from the retry um, that I've talked about, there's different types of retries that you can apply. Pre-configure, basically at the time of generating the service proxy itself, these SDKs get generated. And then it comes out of the box uh, with built-in resiliency. Uh, for retries, then we added circuit breaking, uh, which is at the circuits, uh, sorry, the consumer side itself, when there's a 500 or like uh, any service exception occurring, then it, it stops at the service level itself and then um, uh, it retries for after a given period and then, you know, like that, that's another way of gracefully handling it. So, so yeah, I guess uh, I don't have a slide for showing the SDKs, but that's, that's pretty much what we do to safeguard our system in terms of managing the traffic, in terms of uh, re adding resiliency, built-in resiliency for the consumers. So yeah, that's pretty much. So let me just summarize again. So we at Autodesk have managed um, design documents. Basically, uh, we have a lot of collaboration platforms where we have heavy data running through. And then we have foundational services which are heavily loaded with these requests. So we use controls like traffic management, uh, throttling, and rate limits, and load shedding. So these kind of controls to uh, uh, smoothen the traffic and you know, have a healthy system. So, and uh, we've talked about the algorithms that we have, uh, which is a token bucket, the fixed window, and the rolling window log. And the business drivers for them are the spike arrays, the limited capacity, and monetizing APIs. And yeah, we saw the demo. So that's pretty much about the session. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Again, if you don't ask questions, yeah, it's me. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so you, you mentioned you do the rate limit on both API layer and your service layer, right? So for services, uh, it's straightforward since you, you, have, you have a certain amount of computation power and storage. So I think you, you can kind of calculate how much traffic you can hold. 
but in, on top of the API layer, it will call many services for a single request. And different services may have uh, different conditions. So in this case, how do you, how do you know what, what should be the amount in the API layer that you, you should control? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically, we, we have API gateways, different API gateways for different purposes. Even the internal service to service communication, there are gateways which you use and that is where you apply rate limit configuration per service. So the, it's a self-help uh, uh, kind of setup. So where the service owner, they will know what rate limits to set. They know the capacity of their uh, platform or the product. So we don't do it as a platform team. We offboard it to the service teams and they will, based on the capacity of their service, they will apply the rate limit configuration and they deploy the proxies. So that's how they can safeguard their system. But on the platform side, we apply the global rate limits and the spike carriers kind of setup, which is common for any service. So that, that's how we uh, manage that. Hope I answered your question. Okay. Do you have any more question? Oh, scratching the <laughs> head. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ashwin. Thank you. Thank you.